True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. The young American tourist makes his way through the humid Nizna forest. He's singing happily as he walks. When he gets to the top of the trail, he'll wait there for the couple he met yesterday, as arranged. But when the couple arrive, the young man will not be there. There are another two people watching as he walks, and soon they will pounce, and the young man will never be seen alive again. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to Episode 88, The Serial Crimes of Havenka and Vessels. This episode is sponsored by Just Wellness. Our health is our most valuable asset. Without it, everything else means very little. But it's also the aspect of our lives that we so often put on the back burner, until it's too late and we find ourselves in the doctor's rooms, or worse yet, the hospital. Avoiding ill health should be everyone's goal, and just wellness's range of pure olive leaf extract tinctures are all about preventative medicine. Olive leaf extract has antiviral, antibacterial, antimicrobial and anti-inflammatory properties, amongst many others. Because of these vast benefits, Just Wellness has combined olive leaf extract with South African traditional herbs to create a tincture range to help your system cope naturally. Check out Just Wellness's range of tinctures on their website at justwellness.co.za and you can purchase online through their website too. A huge thank you to Just Wellness for supporting True Crime South Africa. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new Patreon supporters for the week. A huge thank you goes out to Corne Boerta, Joanne Mayer, Uka Mao, Janelle, Tashiana Pillay, Taryn Tink, Irina Libin, Nadine de Clerc, and Anel Lowe for your support on Patreon, as well as Carla de Silva for your support on PayPal. Thank you so much, everyone. Your support really does make a huge difference. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave a link in the show notes. In addition to the shout-out and monthly exclusive episode that Patreons get, I also now upload an ad-free version of every week's episode to Patreon. So if you prefer not to hear the ads, head over to Patreon and sign up for a minimum monthly contribution of just $1, which at the moment is about 16 rand. It's a pretty good deal. If you like discounts, because who doesn't, head over to King Online for your health and beauty needs, print crowd for all your printing requirements, and use the code TCSA10 at checkout for 10% discount and support the show at the same time. And you can get 10% off when you order from Wallpaper Online by using the code TRUECRIME at checkout. Other forms of support that make a huge difference include following the show on social media, inviting your friends, family, postman, hairdresser and parole officer to listen, and leaving reviews on the podcast platform you use. Some of the most fascinating cases I've looked at have involved criminal partnerships. Cases in which two or more people somehow find their way to one another and commit some of the most horrendous crimes together. Today's case is one such situation, and as is often the case in these criminal partnerships, we tend to believe that the older or otherwise power-dominant partner must have been the aggressor in these couples. But as will become quite clear, that is not always the case. And sometimes, it's often the most unlikely of the pair who is really pulling the puppet strings. I will warn you, that at least one of the victims in today's case is under the age of 18, and the episode also includes references to cannibalism. 
My sources for today's episode include Mickey Pistorius's book Strangers on the Street, Pitt Bailefeld's book Dossier of a Serial Sleuth, and several media articles. So let's get into episode 88, The Serial Crimes of Harvenkar and Vessels. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Antony Lawrence Johannes Vessels was born in the 1960s. His parents would not be together for long, though, as in 1962, his father and namesake, Antony Lawrence Vessels Sr., committed a double murder of a married couple on their farm in Turfentine. Vessel Sr. had killed 66-year-old Barney and 55-year-old Fanny Uranowski and been convicted of their murders. At a time in South Africa when the death sentence was still in force, the man would have been a likely candidate to hang. Unfortunately, though, there is very little information available about this crime or what may have become of Vessel Sr. His wife, Antoine's mother, did marry again, and the man would later claim that his stepfather and stepbrother had physically and sexually assaulted him when he was a child. Antoine Vessels became involved with the underworld at a relatively young age. He initially worked as a railway policeman in Johannesburg before moving to Durban, where he occasionally worked as a bouncer at nightclubs, and as a result, allegedly had dealings with organised crime syndicates in the Durban area. On occasion, Vessels worked as a bouncer at a nightclub in Durban called Sand Pebbles. When he wasn't working, he was a patron there too, and it would be there that he would meet 16-year-old Jean-Pierre Havenkar. Havenkar was a resident at Excelsior Place of Safety in Pinetown. Today, the home is described as a government organisation that accommodates boys in conflict from 13 to 17 years of age. As with many places of safety, Excelsior provides a dual purpose. It serves as an awaiting trial facility for young offenders, but it also provides a place of safety for children who have either been removed from the care of their guardians or who have been placed in the care of the state for any other reason. I don't know why Jean-Pierre Havenkau was in Excelsior, but security seemed to be far less strict there in the 90s than it may be now, as he was regularly off the premises and frequenting clubs and pubs in the Durban area. When Vessels and Havenkau met, Vessels was 30 years old and Havenkau was 16. So, as much as the dynamics of this relationship would be drawn into question later, I do want to say up front that this was a predatory relationship. Havenkau was a child, regardless of him engaging in adult behaviours. I also believe that Vessels took advantage of the fact that Havenkau was a young man just coming to terms with the fact that he was gay and new to the gay dating scene. After meeting, the two were soon in a relationship, and before long, plans were made for Jean-Pierre to escape from Excelsior so that he and Vessels could be together. The plan was hatched in September of 1991, but Havenkar did not plan to escape Excelsior on his own. While in the place of safety, Havenkar had met 15-year-old David Seemals when the young boy had been sent to Excelsior after suffering several tragic losses. Young Seemals' biological parents had passed away when he was a child, and he'd been adopted by a couple who then also sadly went on to pass away. When they did, he was seen as too old to be a possibility for adoption, so he was sent to Excelsior. When Havenkar told Seemals that he was going to be running away, and he and Vessels were going to be leaving Durban, Seemals wanted to go with. We will never know how planned this part was. There is every possibility that Vessels and Havenkar had knowingly manipulated Seemals into running away and joining them because they already knew what they had in mind. It would not be unheard of for that to happen in a criminal partnership like this. 
One partner is often the bait, the one that lures victims in. In male-female relationships, that is often the woman. She is less threatening and more likely to get people to trust her. In this situation, Havenka was the younger and more attractive of the two. He was the less threatening one. It would make complete sense to me that he would be used as bait to bring in the couple's first victim. But again, we'll never know for sure. What we do know is that the last time 15-year-old David Seemals was seen alive was his last night at Excelsior Place of Safety. After he and Havenka escaped and joined vessels, the three headed out to the Drakensberg. Vessel's car was packed with camping gear, and the plan was to lie low for a while in the remote reaches of the mountains until the search for the boys had ended. After that, they would head for the furthest possible province. That was allegedly the plan, anyway. But that's not what happened. What happened near Giant's Castle in Drakensberg was the stuff of horror stories, and we can only imagine the terror that ran through young David's mind when he realized he was not part of the group, but rather the prey. At some point in the days after the trio had set up camp in the mountains, the dynamic between them changed. Vessels claimed that Havenkar had started to see Seemals as a threat, and the younger man decided to act. Havenkar overpowered Seemals and raped him. Then, while he restrained Seemals, Vessels raped the young boy, and they then strangled him until he died. After Seemals was dead, both men were hungry, and they hadn't brought enough food with them. Vessels got up and walked over to Seemals' body. He sliced a piece of flesh from the boy's buttocks and cooked it on the fire they had going. Both men ate a piece of the flesh. They would later claim that they'd only done this because they were hungry and denied that cannibalism formed part of any of their fantasies. This would be the first and last time that the pair included cannibalism in their murders, so perhaps there was some truth to that, or perhaps it just didn't interest them as much as they thought it would. With David Seemals dead, Havenka and Vessels left the Drakensberg and headed out to George in Vessels' car. Along the way, if they had money, they would sleep in hotels, but when they ran out... They simply slept in the car on the side of the road. In October 1991, the pair arrived in Nisna Forest, at the same time as several other travellers. Edward Pullmutter was a young American tourist who'd been backpacking through Africa. In October 1991, he was in Nisna. He met a married couple, Mr. and Mrs. Baxter, and the trio hiked the Millwood Trail and stayed over together at Millwood House that night. During the night, another two hikers had arrived. The men had introduced themselves, but the Baxters would only remember that the older man had called himself Norris. The two men were, of course, Havenka and Vessels. During that night, the Baxters would later tell police that the two men had suddenly disappeared. They discovered in the morning that they'd stolen food from them. Of course, the Baxters were upset, but they thought little more of it, as they and Edward Pullmutter packed up and made plans to continue on on the trail later in the morning. Edward set off down the trail, and the Baxters said that they would catch up with him at the head of the trail. They would later tell police that by the time they got there, though, Edward was nowhere to be found. They waited at least an hour and then thought that he must have decided to go on without them, so they left. Sadly, this was not the case. In fact, they had passed Edward on their way to the trailhead, but they would never have seen him. Vessels and Havenka had left Millwood House during the previous night, but they hadn't gone very far. They'd slunk into the dense forest surrounding the house and waited. Then... 
when Edward Perlmutter had come up the trail at first light, singing softly to himself. They'd pounced, dragged him into the bushes, and robbed and killed him. Both men would deny that they had raped Edward, but he was found naked from the waist down, and his underwear was strung up in a tree, like a morbid flag, to mark the pair's horrific act. In this murder, the pair also introduced a new element to their modus operandi. Instead of strangling Edward as they'd done with David Seymour's, they slit the young man's throat. Then they fled with his rucksack and belongings. The next time the pair appeared, they'd found their way to Blue Water Bay in the Eastern Cape. There they met Clive Newman, a businessman from the area. After spending some time with Newman, they decided to rob the man of his maroon opal monza. To do this, they lured Newman to sand dune at Blue Water Bay, overpowered him, bound his hands, and slit his throat. Then the pair fled in Newman's car. As Harvenkar and vessels drove away from Blue Water Bay, headed for Johannesburg, as far away from their latest victims as they could get, they believed that Clive Newman was dead, or at the very least, close to bleeding to death from the gaping wound in his neck. But he wasn't. Clive Newman was discovered by a passerby just minutes after his attempted killers had fled the scene. An ambulance was called, and by the time Harvenkar and vessels neared their destination in Johannesburg, Newman was being rolled out of a life-saving procedure to repair the damage to his throat. He would spend weeks recovering in hospital. His vocal cords were badly damaged, but he was alive and his attackers had no idea. In Johannesburg, Harvenkar and Vessels, driving their victim's car, needed to keep moving. They were pretty sure that, at the very least, Newman's car would have been reported stolen, so they would have to stay on the move. They also, at one point, tried to get rid of the car by leaving it in a seedy part of town, hoping it would be stolen. After a few days, though, when no one had tried to take it, the men picked the car back up and continued using it. Soon, they realised that they needed to move again, and for that, they would need money. The pair met retired prison warder Jakobus Pietrus Hubert in a bar in Pretoria in November 1991. They went back to the man's house with him, and vessels would claim that the man had hit on Havenkar, and that that was when the violence had begun. Considering the pair's modus operandi thus far, though, it seems unlikely, and it seems far more likely, that they'd intentionally baited the man with Harvenkar, and then attacked and killed him. They left Hubert in his bath, and in an attempt to throw the police off, the vessels wrote a racist slur on the walls, to attempt to paint Hubert's murder as a hate crime. As Vessels and Harvenkar prepared to go on the run again after yet another murder, back in Neisner, Edward Pullmutter's parents were desperately trying to get answers from local police. All through his travels on the continent, Edward Pullmutter had abided by one condition from his parents. He had to check in by phone at least once a week, and the young man had done exactly that right up until October 1991, when all contact ceased. After two weeks of no phone calls, his parents did their best from their home in America to drive a missing persons case into their son's disappearance, and his case did get attention. In fact, when a photo of the missing tourist was published in the newspaper, the Baxter couple had come forward and provided police with the information about Edward's last movements. They also put together an identikit of the two men they'd seen in the forest, and who had stolen food from them, and then disappeared in the night. The couple also provided police with snippets of information they remembered from their brief conversation with the two men. The men had mentioned they were from Durban, and the older man, who called himself Norris, said he was a bouncer. 
With this information in hand, Neisner police contacted police in Durban. They shared the little information they had, as well as the identikits of the two men, and considering one of them was clearly a teenager, the Child Protection Unit in Durban was approached as well. Sure enough, the CPU knew exactly who the Neisner police were looking for. It turned out that when Havenkar and David Seemals had run away from Excelsior, a missing persons case had been opened for the two boys. Investigations had identified Antuini Vessels as being the man who may have had knowledge of the location of the two miners, and there had been an arrest warrant out for him ever since. To be 100% certain that they had the right man, the police also contacted the nightclub that CPU's investigations had identified as the place that Havenkar and Vessels had met. The manager there confirmed that he did have a bouncer by the name of Norris, but the man hadn't left Durban, and he'd been working for him all along. The man travelling with, with Jean-Pierre Havenkar was most certainly Antony Vessels. With the last known location of Edward Perlmutter confirmed, Neisner Police Investigator Warrant Officer Lawrence Oliver arranged a search of a 20-square-kilometre area around Millwood House. The search, which included as many police officers as he could get together and scent dogs, was back-breaking work through the dense and humid forest. It would take four runs of the search party along the trail before scent dogs began to react in a specific direction. Twelve metres off the trail, in a particularly dense area of the forest, police discovered the remains of Edward Perlmutter. Warrant Officer Oliver noted how the man had been bound with his hands behind his back and the way his throat had been slit, and this immediately stood out to him. He recalled seeing an article in the newspaper about a man in Blue Water Bay who'd been attacked by two men in a very similar way. That man, of course, was Clive Newman. And Warrant Officer Oliver immediately reached out to the detective in that area. After a brief conversation on the phone and a comparison of the facts of their respective cases, the two policemen realised they were almost certainly both dealing with Havenkar and Vessels. The investigation into the two men now spanned three provinces, and with the Durban CPU having already done a significant amount of background work into Vessels, they pointed to Johannesburg as the most likely place the man would go, considering he'd lived there for most of his life. The three detectives from Neisner, Blue Water Bay and Durban all travelled to Johannesburg to meet with Pete Bailefelt at Brixton Murder and Robbery Unit. Together they identified a house in Buclou where Vessels was known to have a friend he would stay with when he was in Johannesburg. Surveillance was placed on the house, and when the owner returned home, police confronted him. The man told police that Vessels had definitely been in Johannesburg, and he suspected he'd stolen a petrol card from his briefcase. Using this petrol card, the group of detectives traced where it had been used to fill up. The card had been used on the way to the Kruger National Park, and CCTV images showed Clive Newman's maroon Monza but with different number plates. The B on the lookout that had been placed for the Monza with its original plates was updated, and the bank was tasked with contacting police every time a transaction came up on the petrol card. Unfortunately, those transactions were not coming through in real time, so police remained at least a week behind the pair. Vessels and Havenkar were driving around Johannesburg and surrounds, but they seemed aimless, and eventually found their way to Boxburg and the Masonic Hotel. A passing police car spotted the Monza parked outside and called it in. The flying squad responded immediately and arrested Havenkar and Vessels. At that point, they believed that they were being arrested in connection with the stolen vehicle. Detective Oliver from Neisner Police questioned Vessels first. They'd immediately separated him and Havenkar, and when he asked Vessels who the car belonged to, 
the man said it was his friend's. Oliver then informed Vessels that he was from Neisner, and he'd been tracking him for weeks. The understanding dawned that this was no longer about the car, and Vessels shut down immediately. Oliver then went into the room where Harvenkar was being held and sat down in front of the young man. Almost immediately, Harvenkar broke down and told Oliver that the gun belonging to the man they killed in Pretoria was under the seat of the car. Of course, police didn't yet know that the murder of Jacobus Hubert was linked to the two men, but now they did. With this information in hand, Oliver, along with Bailefelt, went back to Vessels. They told him that Harvenkar had confessed, leaving it at that for Vessels to fill in the blanks. Vessels admitted that they had killed Edward Perlmutter, Jacobus Hubert, and Clive Newman. He still didn't know that Newman had survived. He then gave them a piece of information they didn't have. Their first victim had been David Seymour. The Durban CPU had been wondering where David had gone, as they had expected to find him with Vessels and Harvenkar, but now they knew. He hadn't made it past the first few days with the other two. With their confessions in hand, police combed the Monza for further physical evidence. They found some of Edward Perlmutter's belongings, as well as Jacobus Hubert's gun in the car. Then, it was time for the most bizarre road trip of some of the officers' lives. Vessels was placed in one car, and Harvenkar in another. Those vehicles drove separate routes and were driven by officers not linked to any of the cases. One set out in one direction and the other in the opposite direction, so that no one could say that one was leading the other to the pointing outs. A third car set out with some of the land's finest detectives from the provinces the pair's crimes had impacted. Oliver from Neisner, Whale from Bluewater Bay, Zeely from CPU Durban, and Bailefelt from Brixton. They would follow Vessel's vehicle from a distance, again ensuring that they did not in any way appear to influence the pointing outs. The first stop was Neisner. It took an entire day for Vessel's to find the murder site in the clammy heat. When he pointed out the place where they had strung Edward's underwear from the tree, Bailefelt immediately asked if, if they'd raped the man. Both denied that they had. The next stop was in the Drakensberg. The scene was being approached for the first time, and given its isolated nature, it's unlikely David's remains would ever have been found if the killers hadn't pointed it out. Bailefelt, with his particular brand of ironic justice, made vessels carry the body bag containing David's remains, out of the mountains. After delivering David's remains to the mortuary in Durban for forensic processing and formal DNA identification, the odd collection of vehicles containing killers and cops headed for Pretoria. There, Jacobus Hubert's home was pointed out, and Vessels explained how he'd written the racist phrase on the wall to throw police off. This had not been in any media articles about the murder and was considered guilty knowledge. By this time, Harvenkar and Vessels had been made aware that Clive Newman had survived, so a pointing out of that scene was not necessary, as the man himself would testify to what he'd endured in court and where it had occurred, along with the witness that had found him. Harvenkar and Vessels being in possession of Newman's vehicle, linked them conclusively to the crime in any case, as did the M.O. being the same as Edward's murder. With the bizarre road trip complete, Vessels and Harvenkar were officially charged and imprisoned in the awaiting trial cells. DCS officials were under strict instructions to keep the men in separate cells and ensure that they had absolutely no contact. This irked both men tremendously, 
and vessels demanded that Havenkar be moved to his cell so that he could ensure no harm came to him. Of course, this was not going to happen, and considering Havenkar had been the one to spill the beans, police were concerned that vessels may well harm the boy himself. Although it's rather common for offenders who've confessed to withdraw their confessions, these two did not do that, perhaps realising that the evidence against them was far too significant. Both men would be found guilty in 1992 of three counts of murder and one of attempted murder. Antony Vessels was handed down the death penalty, which was still applicable at that time. Jean-Pierre Havenkar was given a 25-year prison sentence. The judge remarked in his sentencing that any parole for Havenkar should be considered very carefully. In 1994, when the death penalty was abolished, Vessel's sentence was commuted to life, and he remains in prison today. As for Havenka, considering it's been 30 years since he was sentenced, he actually should have already served his time and been released. The only reference I can find to this, though, is in a 2015 article, where at 23 years of his sentence, his release was being discussed and opposed. But as far as I can tell, after 2017, there would have been no legal mechanism to keep him in prison, so he is probably out. In a strange and tragic twist, Clive Newman, who survived having his throat so savagely slit, was murdered in 2009. Newman, who'd been a businessman when he was attacked by vessels in Harvenkar, in 1991, had become an Anglican priest after he recovered. He'd moved to Grahamstown and worked with the homeless and destitute there. In 2009, he picked up a man who was living on the street and took him to his home. The man would later claim that Newman had made sexual advances toward him, and as a result, he'd attacked Newman and killed him. The dynamic between Harvenkar and Vessels was certainly an interesting one. Although the initial partnership was certainly unfair and a power play on Vessels' part, questions would be raised about just how complicit, and perhaps even the driving force, Harvenkar had been. Pete Bailefelt remarked that of the two killers, he saw far more emotion and what he saw as true regret from Vessels than he did from Havenkar. The younger man did break down and confess to Bailefeld earlier than Vessels, but this may well have been tactical on his part. All of the detectives involved said that they were struck by how utterly calm Havenkar was on the scenes, and his initiation of the rape on David Seymour also seemed to indicate that he was at least an equal aggressor. The idea of two people like this finding their way to one another horrifies most of us. How is it possible, and would either of these men have done the same thing on their own? In Dr. Gerard Labaskakny's latest book, he discusses the murderous partnership of Shanae van Heerden and Martins van der Merwe, and says it's unlikely that either of the two would have committed the murder they did on their own. The pathologies in each of them fed off one another until a perfect storm was created in which any horrific thing was possible. Jean-Pierre Havenkar may well have been manipulated by vessels in the beginning, and he likely was looking for the acceptance and protection from a partner that he found in the man. But I do think that once the murders got going... Each of them contributed equally to keeping them going. David Seymour's 15 years on Earth were utterly tragic. Having lost his biological parents, he went on to be adopted, only to lose those parents as well. Then, he trusted the wrong person, and in a last bid to find some form of family, he was lured and baited, and then brutally had his life taken away from him. Of all the tragic scenes in this case, 
It is young David. His remains laying out on the slopes of the Drakensberg, alone and discarded, that I think haunts me the most. Edward Perlmutter was just enjoying a backpacking trip around the continent. The Baxter couple described him as friendly and kind, and they would have enjoyed spending the rest of their trip with him. His death, too, savagely attacked in a humid forest, so close, yet so far from help, is just utterly unbelievable. Jacobus Hubert thought that he'd met two potential friends, maybe partners, who he could enjoy an evening with. But instead, he realised too late that he'd invited two predators into his home, and what should have been a relaxing retirement ended instead in violence and terror. Clive Newman survived the brutal attack against him against all odds. His voice was damaged, and he lived with a scar on his throat as a badge of survival. He testified against the two men and helped send them to prison. And then, as though he had already not been through enough, somehow, yet another predator found him later in his life, and this time he wasn't so lucky. Pitt Bailefeld said that he believed that there were more victims out there. Hubert's murder, for instance, would not have been linked to the two men if they hadn't told them about it. So how many others were there like that? It is terrifying to think that two minds, with such savagery hidden within them, could find one another. But it's not nearly as rare as we might think, or indeed hope. Every day, people pass each other in the street. Their thoughts and fantasies held within the safe confines of their minds. But every now and then, two pairs of eyes meet. A connection is made. And each knows that they've found someone just like them. David Seemels, Edward Perlmutter, Jakobus Hubert, and Clive Newman. Rest gently. Thank you for listening to episode 88, The Serial Crimes of Harvin Carr and Vessels. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Live Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon. Mm-hmm.